From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. Whenever we ask people to list what it is about our society today that makes it hard for them to be optimistic, the top three responses are almost invariably the media, climate change, and politics. The last one largely expressed by frustration with polarization and a general distrust or apathy regarding our election system. My guest today is a leader of an organization that is taking on the third of these concerns, politics and government, by focusing on training girls and young women to participate more fully in our political process, up to including running for office themselves. Sarah Guillermo is the CEO of Ignite, bringing to the role over 15 years experience, helping young women break into America's political landscape to become leaders within their communities and beyond. Sarah was one of the first employees at Ignite over a decade ago and quickly ascended within the organization, eventually taking over as CEO in June of 2021. And as someone who has dedicated her life to empowering women, she's proud to lead by example as an immigrant, first-generation college student, youth organizer, educator, foster parent, and breast cancer survivor. Sarah's analysis and expertise has also been featured widely in national media outlets such as CBS News, NPR, CNBC, The New York Times, Forbes, USA Today, and now the big one, the Blue Sky Podcast. As you'll soon hear, Sarah has had a remarkable life and career so far and brings incredible energy and intelligence to her work. I hope you enjoy this Blue Sky conversation with Sarah Guillermo as much as I did. Sarah Guillermo, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. It is my pleasure. And I'd like to start towards the beginning of your life. If I have my research right, your family immigrated to this country when you were two years old. Can you tell us where from and what that was like being a child of immigrants? Yeah, I moved here when I was two, but my family came in waves. Okay. So my grandfather came first and then my grandma. And then my mom came actually six months after I was born. Wow. And then she started the whole petition process. Why well, I finally got to come when I was two. But my dad didn't come until I was seven. Oh, so wow. it was a long, that was a longer wave between two and seven. And so we went back to the Philippines quite periodically as, um, as much as we could afford it to spend some time with my dad and for him to know me as I was growing up. Um, and, you know, there's a lot <laughs> about yeah. being an immigrant in this country um, and a lot that actually really paved the way for me wanting to just serve my community, um, really, yeah. and thinking about that. And so coming to America is like finding a whole new world with opportunity. In the Philippines, it's like you get to go through all of these different hard parts to yeah. get to the good part. And um, there's a lot of people in our family um, and within our community in the Philippines that want to get to America um, in order to have a different life um, and have to have a better life for the next generation. And that's what my grandparents did for my mom and my mom did for me. Um, and similar to that, there's also a lot of, you know, generational trauma that sure. gets passed down because my mom, my both my parents were very young when they had me. So imagine, you know, my mom was in her early 20s coming to America and then having yeah. to build a whole new life and then suddenly having a toddler um, yeah. and being functionally a single parent until my sure. father got here. Um, and sure, we had a lot of family to support, but there is a reality of being the solo parent in a new country, raising yes. your kid um, and all that comes to be when you are who we are. And so, you know, you see a lot of things at an early age and you see what those lenses look like from 
healthcare to like the jobs that we had and all of those <laughs> experiences. Sure. And so there's a lot of intersections that I started to build because I grew up with my mom and my grandmother. That's, you know, we shared apartments and homes together. Um, and then my dad moved in when he got here. And so there's a lot to think about in the cross sections of what it's like to come to America, to start to live in America, and then to think about where we are today. Fascinating. And and uh, frequent listeners of this podcast will know what I'm about to say, which is I've always considered immigrants to be the ultimate optimists, you know, to come to a new country with high hopes and stick to itiveness and tenacity. And you clearly have, have demonstrated all that. In fact, also back to my research, my understanding that you ran for office the first time at a very young age. When was that? Yeah, um, I was in first grade, <laughs> and I think I was six or seven, and there was an opportunity in Miss Anderson's class to be the classroom organizer, Ooh. and nobody wanted to volunteer, <laughs> um, and you actually had to run, like, these, like, mini campaigns, because you couldn't just volunteer, and then, like, you know, what what was a six-year-old? I have a five-year-old now, and he'll volunteer to yeah. do anything, <laughs> um, and so you had to run these, like, mini campaigns to get, you know, quote unquote, elected to do this job in the classroom. And I had a strong desire to have the colored pencils and the crayons in their specific cubes yes. before you got them and after you got them. So I actually applied and ran for the position of classroom organizer. And um, I won <laughs> yes. by campaigning with my, um, with my friends and just my classroom. And then you know, I started to go um, and participate in whole school experiences um, as a leader of my classroom, organizing yeah. my classroom. I then I didn't realize it wasn't just about organizing colored pencils. It was also about organizing what was happening in your classroom um, across grade levels. So I started to go to these grade level conversations around the table. And what I saw quickly was that I was the sometimes the only girl. And then also sometimes like the brownness of them all. Um, mm. And so I think when you're thinking about who's sitting around the table, that starts to like shift the way that your <laughs> brain moves at such an early age. Um, and so right. I kept running for positions. I served a lot of different leadership positions throughout my entire educational <clears throat> career. And I think it's not just about like the big job. Um, I think here at Ignite, we're really thinking about like, what are even the positions at the most local level? Like my favorite is the mosquito abatement board um, <laughs> or your school hey. board, or I serve on a health commission. And so there's a lot of responsibility and leadership that can happen in all facets of our life. So you just mentioned Ignite. Let's talk about it. What What is Ignite all about? What did they do? And then we'll talk a little bit more about your role and how you got to where you got. So tell us about Ignite. Yeah, so Ignite's a movement, the largest movement of young women who are ready and eager to become the next generation of political leaders. And I can dig into all the facets, but um, I'll let you ask me about each of the, which direction you want to go in first, because I've been, a, yeah. I'm a longtime igniter. <laughs> yes, I know you are. So my understanding is that you, um, I, I heard you say one time that you help young women take their ambition and run with it. And so a young woman with, amb with ambition is one thing, but they need skills. Oftentimes, these are things that have to be taught, learned. You just don't – you're not born knowing how to raise money or do public speaking and endorsements. So could you talk about those kinds of things and how you train young women to get better at this? Yeah. And so, you know – at the early stage, when we started in 2010, um, there was a lot of connecting the dots. So I was Ignite's one of Ignite's first facilitators in the classroom. And I was working at a 6th through 12th grade school in East Oakland called Wilson Prep. And yep. as we were bringing young women into the classroom to teach them about civic engagement and running for office, um, there was some core activities that we did, and it was really to connect the dots of who was leading them within their communities and what was the social issue that they were facing and how did those 
all connect and how are they intersected? So like yeah. take, for example, um, one of the young women um, was really um, worried about having stop signs in front of the school because there was a lot of frequent um, folks that would just drive super fast in front of the school. And we had a couple um, hit and runs of our oh, students gosh. in front of the school. And so oh. she was really worried about that as much as we all were um, in the community. And so we went down this exercise of like, who makes a decision about that stop sign or lack thereof. And yeah. so she discovered it was actually the planning commission of the city of Oakland that decides where, what are the speed limits? Where are, where do stop signs go? And like, mm -hmm. where do bumps? Um, what yeah. I was like the bumps, speed bumps, yeah, speed, <laughs> speed bumps, bumps um, <laughs> go in the community. And so that simple thing about what was that? Like, is it the light bulb? Is it the right. speed bump? connecting those dots. And so once you help them understand who's actually making that decision, because then she's discovered who sits on the planning commission, who right. are these people? Do they actually drive in my neighborhood? Do they understand the needs of my neighborhood? And more often than not, what the young women discover is that the folks that are serving in these positions do not represent them, have never mm -hmm. had or have shared lived experiences with them. And so there's a big disconnect. And so that was the early days of Ignite. There was a lot of connecting those dots. I will tell you after 2016, there was a little bit less of that. It was actually a lot more education around what are the things that you can do and how can you use all of your energy for good and change yep. um, and thinking about what does political leadership look like beyond running for office or in addition to running for office. Oh, by the way, Sarah, just to, just to stop you there too, because it seems you start in a really important place because it's not just, hey, guys, let's go run for U.S. Senate. It's, it's a civics lesson. How do these things work? I mean, if I polled everyone listening to this, who who would decide where the stop sign goes in in Oakland in front of a school? They wouldn't know. So you're you're giving them a really solid grounding in civics education, which some many argue is lacking in our schools. So you supplement that in a big way. Yeah, it doesn't exist. I mean, I think there's a lot of nonprofits that play that part um, and try to supplement it, which we're doing the best we can within that. But it is very challenging, and so I think you know to the to the understanding like you have to understand before you can train right so we get to that root of the foundation is like i need you to understand that x y who's in power how are they making the decisions and connect and like literally playing the connect the dot game yep. and then from there we're talking about how do you articulate your message so what does public speaking look like public speaking could be in front of an audience of ten thousand people it could be in the conversation we're having right now but how do i articulate the message so that people one feel me can resonate with what i'm saying and mm -hmm. ultimately influence them to do something Right. And so there's that level of work. Um, there's also the level of work of like, how do I then organize my community? I can't be the only person that cares about the stop sign. Yeah, right. <laughs> I literally can't. We all care about these kids not getting hit in front of their school. And so how do I organize my community? So does that look like a petition? Does that look like I have to have a town hall conversation first? Do I? Does that mean I just need to knock on the doors and actually have these conversations with my community members and then bring them along, right? So those are two examples of just some core tactics that you can put in any layer of political leadership. You're going to need to always be able to say what you want to say and yep. make sure that people hear you. And then the other part is you're going to need to be able to build enough rapport with whoever you're working with. So whether it's organizing a campaign, you need to mobilize your volunteers, you need to mobilize your entire campaign team, you need to raise money. And then when you're in office you have to actually talk to people <laughs> right. and not, you know, your constituents and the people on your staff and the other legislators within whatever branch of government you sit in. And you need to be able to coalesce around something. Right. Yep. And so I think those, when we're talking about the hard skills, those are the most transferable ones that I think that we at Ignite train on and then actually like provide communities and networks to continue to practice that um, in all layers of our political leadership trainings.
Sarah's desire to serve expressed itself early when she raised her hand and became a classroom organizer in first grade. I'm embarrassed to say that when I was that age, I was one of the kids who could have used someone like Sarah in that position. Let's just say I wasn't always great about returning things back to where I found them. From there, she's gone on to increasingly higher levels of leadership, now serving as the head of Ignite. There's a lot to admire about the work that this organization does. I'm a particularly big fan of their emphasis on civics, teaching young people to understand and appreciate how our government works, knowledge that enables them to participate more actively and effectively. Her example about the stop sign at the school is a great one. Many might assume that this issue is one for the school's principal or the district superintendent, but instead it's the city's planning council to whom concerned students and parents should voice their concerns. This knowledge is empowering and key to making the changes that citizens want to see. Getting back to our conversation, I wanted Sarah to talk about another positive outcome of learning more about how our system works, increased voter turnout. I assume too, in all of this, whether it's, I don't know if you emphasize this or not, but in learning about all these things, it would also encourage these young women to vote, right? I mean, they, a lot of people today and in this country, our turnout is disappointingly low in most elections, in all elections, really. And I think young people, it's easy to be disillusioned. And so the fact that you're, you're doing this civics training, you're explaining how things work, I would think a young woman would say, you know, gosh, I better make sure I'm registered to vote. This is really important. Yeah, I agree 110%. What we know about Ignite Young Women is if they are eligible to vote, they register and turn out at 96%. Really? 96%. <laughs> and we have trained 35,000 <laughs> and counting young women across the country. And so- If you did and, nothing else, that would be a huge achievement. Truly. That's incredible. Literally. Literally. <laughs> so I wow. think when you're thinking about that- um, that's huge when you're thinking about Gen Z. So Ignite, when we started, worked heavily with millennials because that was, you know, the 14 and 25 of the day. Now yes. millennials are getting a little older. We're getting more sophisticated. <laughs> yes, millennials yes. speaking for herself and her generation. Um, and now we are focusing, shifting our focus to Gen Zers. So Gen yes. Zers um, born in 1997, and um, <laughs> that's the earliest. And You're making me youngest, feel old, Sarah. This is I know. Very unfair, I mean, but I'm keep like going. 1997. Um, keep going. <laughs> and the youngest right now is you know nine to ten years old, and so uh, that's going to be Ignite's focus for the next 15 years is thinking about this generation and their turnout. And we just did a research study in May. And we've been doing research since 2019 as an organization. And what we've learned over time now is that Gen Z, as in this particular age group of 18 to 25 year olds in the Gen Z category, are voting at the at higher rates than millennials when we were 18 to 25. Interesting. And Gen Xers when they were 18 to 25 by like hmm. 10 to 15 points. Wow. Um, and so that's pretty huge in thinking about overall turnout. Um, we've been doing some research, too, of what the turnout looks like from a midterm election cycle to a presidential mm -hmm. election cycle. And so the numbers from 2022 are very promising in thinking about why they turned out to mm -hmm. vote. And so we also ask a lot of questions around why you turn out to vote. And for this particular generation, it's not necessarily about the candidate. It's about the issues that they care most about. Um, yes. And so when when candidates are really trying to get to them, I think that there's a really big component in thinking about how are you going to get the Gen Z vote. And we're looking at a couple different samples of like population from the Gen Z in general in our study. And then we splice that up from folks that identify as Gen Z young women and non-binary and Gen Z young men and non-binary compared to the Ignite population yes. of Gen Zers. And the top issue that they care most about across the board are mass shootings. And so if you can imagine, we all know why we don't have to like go down a rabbit hole of why is that? Because we know that why that's true. And I think when you think about the differences of then what comes after 
there are some stark differences between young women and young men. Um, Mm. And so I think that there's a lot to think about for the upcoming 24 election and how we engage them. And so, um, you know, I keep telling my team, I would love for voting to feel like it was just like brushing your teeth, that it was just such a regular activity that you didn't have to think about it and it didn't feel like a test. Because a lot of what we've heard from Gen Zers, and it feels like they're getting nailed a very big test. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, adults also. And so what do you do with a test? And so at Ignite, we're thinking about it from an education perspective, understanding what's on your ballot to a mobilization perspective, like, great, you filled out your ballot. How can you help 10 of your friends do the same thing? And then also obviously getting your ballot turned in. (laughs) So how how do young women find Ignite? How does Ignite find women to and 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 what is the structure? Do they go to a physical place to have this training or how does it all work? Well, it's all of the above these days. So from the perspective of where how do they find us? They find us on social media. Um, okay. that has been kind of the core thing like literally they Google political yeah. leadership or some kind of advocacy training. And so we, so there is that method of finding us there. We also have program staff and fellows um, who are community organizers on college campuses across the country that are okay. actually actively recruiting young women. So we have student led okay. clubs on about 75 college campuses across the country wow. um, in communities wow. like Texas and, you know, states like Texas and Florida and Ohio and New York here in the Bay area um, and yes. all over Southern California. And so the fellow, is in the community. They are 99% usually from the community, um, even though Mm -hmm. the target is colleges. They go in, they go to the college, and they're either, you know, coming in to meet with an administrator or they're coming in to meet with students already. And Mm -hmm. they, we have a pretty robust curriculum that can start to help them build the club on their campus. So, whatever that looks like, a voter reg drive, how to understand a piece of public policy, how to have these conversations on campus um, to start to drive engagement. The turnout numbers Sarah cites here are amazing. And I really appreciate what Ignite is doing to help young people understand their ballots when it comes time to vote. Increasingly, it seems, Ballots are approaching the complexity of a tax return to the point where people are unsure about what they're actually voting for or against. The proliferation of ballot initiatives in many states has only made this problem worse. So it's cause for optimism to hear that Ignite is trying to do something about it. Next, I asked Sarah to tell us why she was so attracted to an organization that was focused on helping girls and young women become leaders. Actually, there's so many reasons. Um, I think one of the (laughs) core pieces is I grew up with women in my family that were just strong human beings. Um, Mm -hmm. My mom, my grandmother, my aunts, my my other grandmother, like everybody, my cousins, like I just looked up to phenomenal women. I will also say that when I came to America in that kindergarten classroom and I saw that image of all of those presidents, I was very confused Mm. where the women were because that is in (laughs) Philippine classrooms, you do have women on those presidential pictures. Um, And so that was very confusing for me. (laughs) And, um, and then I remember too, being an immigrant, like understanding what being an immigrant meant in America is that I couldn't (laughs) run for president. Um, And I was really upset about that. I mean, my mom can (laughs) tell you a whole journey of (laughs) getting me through the fact that Sarah Guillermo could not be president of the United States, um, but could lead in other ways was a big piece. Yes. And then, you know, I think the other component is, um, and our founder and Moses, um, and I both come from social work backgrounds. Um, and you know, there's a whole stigma around social work where you have to like respond to the problem. Right. And, and at Ignite, we really believe that like the leaders, 
that we need today are already impacted by all of the problems in this society, and we are the best ones to navigate our way out of it. Um, And so there are already so many lived experiences of the young women that we've trained. So our job is to provide them this space, to provide them the training, but they already have what they need already to be political leaders within the community. Um, And so I think when you're looking at it from that strengths-based approach versus like a rapid response version, that's, it's a different sense of, um, of a vibe, I guess you would say, um, in the way that we think about the work that we're doing every day. Um, And that, I mean, that's what makes me most optimistic about the world is like, we already have the change makers. We just need to get them. We need to bring them together, give them the skills and the tools that they need, and they will be fine. And then in return, we will be fine. Exactly. So, uh, like I said, you didn't found this organization, uh, but you're at the top of it now. So can you, can you talk about your your sort of progression through Ignite and how you wound up in the, the big seat now? Yeah, well, I, yeah, the biggest seat of the lonely big <laughs> seat up top. Um, <laughs> In, in different corners in whatever room I can be in, right? Yeah, I started as a high school facilitator. So mm-hmm. I met Anne in 2009 as she was just beginning to found Ignite. And she pitched me this idea. I was an after school, um, I don't remember my title, but I was working after school programming at that point. And we needed, we, we did, I did all the partnerships. And so we brought, um, we brought the program to the school and I actually, facilitated the program program with the students. Um, and I did that for almost like five and a half, six years. Wow. Um, and then I um, moved on to actually join Ignite full time in 2015. And at that point, we were in California and in Texas and had a very state based model. Um, and in 2015, in the fall, we actually decided that it was time to think about what a national footprint and a mm. national framework for the organization could be. So I served in like a quote unquote state role for a year. um, And then I actually got promoted to lead our national programmatic efforts across the country. So I served as a chief program officer for about four years um, and really did two main things. One is we launched a national fellowship model, which is what I was talking about earlier with the college community organizers. So we started with four and now we have 20 and we have actually trained over a hundred of them all across the country. Um, And I did that work for about right in the middle of the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, we don't have to talk about March 15th, March 16th of 2020, but I pivoted um, a lot of our pro, uh, you know, our in-person programming that was about 80% on in person to a hundred percent online in a matter of six weeks. Um, And so to build the infrastructure quickly to execute, to meet the moment for our young people. And then I got promoted to ED um, in that same year and then moved on, moved up or moved on to um, the CEO position in the middle of 2021. And I'm now going into my third year of leading the organization. And so it's my 13th year of service to Ignite. And so it's been amazing to see the organization from where we were, were, you know, doing a lot of the work in Anne's home in her basement um, and writing curriculum and thinking about the big, bold vision and to get us to the state, to the national, and then to where we are today and really thinking about being in over 30 states, having trained 35,000 young women and really shifting the footprint of what it means to be a political leader in this country and um, how to actually do that. Incredible. And my understanding is you do everything you can to not necessarily espouse a certain political position or party or persuasion, but rather the goal is to get young women involved in politics and public service of some sort. Is that a fair way to describe it? Yeah. So we're a nonpartisan organization. And at the end of the day, like if you're just looking at numbers to think about how do we get to gender parity in political office, we it's not a one party solution no. by any means. And right. so um, we do maintain a nonpartisanship stance in the work. Um, so meaning we don't endorse candidates and we don't endorse particular policies um, on when we're voting. And so 
I think that's actually helped us navigate a lot of the different experiences that the young women are facing and really thinking about what's next and what do they need, um, knowing that this next 15 years are going to be heavily focused on a generation that is growing up right now um, in a very different light than how the millennial generation grew up. It's a great approach because I also assume, you know, the bigger the tent, you have more supporters, you have more donors. And we should talk about your business model. You're a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. So do you take charitable contributions to we do. fund your yeah. operations? So it's a C3. Tell us about that. Okay. Yeah, it's a C3. So um, our funding comes from large foundations or, yeah, I mean, small, medium, large foundations across the country. We do have a very engaged major donor base. Um, and we have some corp money as well, which is a smaller percentage of our budget. And then we do have um, a grassroots um, giving campaign. Okay. And so 13 years in now, Ignite, and I think you said 14 to 24 year old is the- Yeah, the, 14 to 25. Okay, to 25. So 13 plus 25. So the 25 year olds- in your program 13 years ago or now 38. I did that in my head. Um, do you, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of people now. Are you seeing, are there, are there people in political positions now? Are you seeing people really getting into places of influence? And, and I assume if that, I assume the answer is yes. And then that must fuel the fire of these young, other young women seeing what's possible. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, we, to date, we've had over a hundred young women run and nearly like 60 to 70% of them actually win their elections. Two weeks ago, we had five young women on the ballot. Wow. Um, and that was very exciting on, you know, an off election cycle year. Sure. Um, and I remember one of our participants, I met her in 2016 in Minneapolis. She was one of our first college uh, participants in our new model. <laughs> so it was like a brand new community for us. Her name is Orange Chowdhury. And um, she then took on organizing and campaign positions. Um, after she graduated from college and she ran for city council, started her campaign in the summer and just won. Wow. Um, and she's in her, you know, mid twenties. And so it's amazing to think about, you know, there's that path of coming in and doing and participating in a college program then having all of these different positions and then now serving. And so yeah. I think today is actually her um her swearing in day oh wow which is very exciting i mean those <laughs> oh, are like great. um and so that's so exciting it's like one of those i'm going to try to zoom in um cuz i obviously everything's on zoom now as well but yeah. um i just think about like i watching the young women get sworn in that's one of my favorite activities to watch i try to go in person if it's if i am actually in town or local enough um but to watch that and to see the mission come to fruition in that way has been really amazing. Um, and it's the deepest honor to be able to have even played a role in their path to get there. Um, Incredible. And running for office and winning is huge. And simultaneously, you need so many women around you and so many people around you to get you there. So we're already also training campaign staffers. We're also training people to be, to understand how a bill becomes law. We're also sure. training them on how to apply for local boards and commissions like that mosquito <laughs> abatement board. Yes. Yes. Um, and we really, really want them to think about what does it mean to mobilize their communities to vote? So yeah. we believe that all five of those strands as political leaders is critical, critical to one, getting young women to actually be in political office, but also to sustain them there. I imagine that one of the reasons Ignite has been so successful is because they approach the people they teach and train with the mindset that they already have the personal strengths required to lead. They simply need the support and know-how necessary to move to the next level. And the fact that they are also nonpartisan is refreshing in today's political environment. And Sarah makes sense when she says that the challenge of getting more women into leadership positions does not have a one-party solution. And how about their results? Over 100 women have run for office, and more often than not, they've won. And a quick aside, 
When Sarah mentioned her disappointment over not ever being able to run for president because she wasn't born in this country, it raised for me an old question. Is this section of the U.S. Constitution something we still want to have? It's in Article 2, Section 1, by the way, if you want to look it up. I remember it coming up back when Arnold Schwarzenegger was a popular governor of California. People wondered if he might not make a good president. Only problem was he could never run because he wasn't born here. Likewise, this issue drove all the conspiracies and back and forth about Barack Obama's birth certificate several years ago. Anyway, back to this blue sky conversation with Sarah Guillermo. For the final segment, I asked her to talk about how and why her organization continues to scale and drive results. I would think too, this success begets success, right? So I remember working with another organization that was trying to train professional scientists. And they said, you know, one of the reasons kids don't grow up wanting to be a scientist is because many never see them as they're growing up. They want to be athletes and rock stars because that's who they see, right? And so now you come, you come here and you see male presidents all over the classroom. And then slowly young women start seeing women in these roles. And it it's a flywheel effect and it just grows. And I assume too that these grateful alumni hopefully will be coming back and meeting with your your young people and saying, this is what can happen. Yeah, they definitely do. We also employ for our uh, workforce is 40% alum. Um, and we wow. also have alums sit on our board wow. um, to help us grow and fundraise for the organization and to help us with our strategy. And so our, our alum are our largest assets. Um, and so we are deeply invested in them as much as we were when we were just imparting the idea of ambition with them um, and training them. Um, and so, you know, I spend a lot of time texting on the phone when I'm traveling. It's literally my favorite activity outside of having to ask for money. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I also right. love to do. Yeah. Um, but because it's not about me, right? It's about this movement. And this yes. movement is so critical. And so sitting with them, you know, taking a tour of their office or like, yeah. you know, seeing the library that they've been working to build for the past, you know, I don't know, Jocelyn's are working on this library for two terms now, and it's going to be this wow. huge civic center. And so to, to know them, to play a part in any portion of their political leadership journey, and then to actually see what they're doing in their communities has been the most amazing experience. And I think as they get older, I think back to your question earlier, as they get older too, they're going to keep running for positions that are higher. So like I had a young sure. woman who was in a city council seat for about two terms and then decided she was ready to run for mayor. She didn't win the race this November, but she was only off by like less than a hundred votes. Wow. And so to know and understand that somebody at 26 could have run a campaign that not only changed the narrative of her community, but there was a deep sense of actually they saw that she was a viable political leader and an actor in her community changes everything. And so we're doing that all across the country. And I just learned the other day, we actually have college programming in South Dakota, um, wow. a site that I tell you would not have shown up on my original right. list of sites, but like right. they're doing it. And so that is the other part of the model is like, the model is replicable without a staff member, which is sure. the biggest thing that we can um, that we can do in this day and age. Incredible. And there are many reasons I'm, I'm glad you're doing an episode with us. But one of the big ones for me is that I get concerned, especially with young people and people my age, that people are losing faith in democracy. They're losing faith in our system. People are questioning election results. And it's and it's kind of perilous if we don't keep things on track. And as I talk to you and as I researched you, you seem to bring to this work an incredible sense of optimism, an incredible sense of we can do this, an incredible sense of roll up your sleeves, run for office, don't complain, get out and do something about it. I'd love to hear you talk about that because I'm sure there are times when you get discouraged too, but somehow you bring to this work this amazing energy and positivity. So can you describe that? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, in November of 2016, we thought we were going to elect the first female president in the country. And um, it was also a moment for Ignite of like, wow, 
how do we continue? How do we continue? And I remember sitting there and I was like, guys, we're the long game. Yes. We're the long game. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, and I will tell you, that's an interesting thing to think about from a press angle and from a funder angle, when you're really explaining what does a long game even mean when we are in utter crisis every single day. And so, uh, you know, I think a lot of that for us is take a look at the pyramid of elected offices across the country. Right. So the top percent is about less than a thousand seats. Yes. And at Ignite, we're focused on the half a million seats from the mayor to the mosquito abatement board. Yes. And so I know everyone laughs at me. They're like, oh my God, she's going to talk about the mosquito abatement board again. But like, it is really critical. Yes. <laughs> there is a need for it in a lot of communities across this country. And I think that when folks feel like things are in peril, they may not be wrong. And simultaneously, when we're thinking about the work of Ignite, we're really thinking about how are we going to do this for the long duration. So we are building generational shifts. So when I talk about a shift in the way of how people are turning out to vote, 10 to 15 to 20 percent higher than a prior generation, that is change. It's amazing. It's yes, changed. And, and and I do appreciate your your emphasis on some of these more local offices because that's where a lot of actual tangible benefit or or the opposite happens to people in their real lives. Back to your stop sign a- analogy, and you're building a system where you don't just wake up one day and are, and you're ready to run for president. You you work your way up through other elected offices. Presumably, some people come in from different ways, but you you have to you have to build your resume, you have to build your career, you have to build that background. And it seems like you've taken a really smart approach with that. Well, I mean, think about 2020, and we watched George Floyd get murdered. Mm. I came up with this idea called Power to the People, and it was – I mean, I didn't come up with that idea. That's what I called it. <laughs> yes. I know what Power to the People in the yes, whole yes. light of it. I, Sarah did not come up with that. <laughs> but Sarah did come up with this notion of how – what's the most local thing we can do? Because people are, are upset with the police. They exist mm-hmm. – in the country. They exist in local communities. So what can we do? And so we have boards and commissions training. And I did research with my intern of the top like 50 most populated cities in the country. And what we found was that of those cities, only six had citizen-led police commissions, meaning Mm. most police commissions were actually associated with a mayor which has a deep connection from a whole other side. And so we went and did two things. One, we wanted to train the young women that we had in Ignite to actually apply to serve on these boards, to to serve on the police commission. And in states like, or in cities like Columbus and in San Diego, we actually worked really, really hard to get it on the ballot Hmm. to start a citizen-led police commission. And it passed. Wow. In 2020. It's like, so from June to November of 2020. So I know that like for Gen Zers and for policy, it takes like a really long time. But that was a deep sense of mobilization from this young generation that got people to turn out to vote and got people to understand what that last thing was on their ballot because it's usually (laughs) the last thing all the way at the bottom. For Californians, it's like page... 10 of 13 yes. on the ballot yes. and like it has like this much information on <laughs> it but what that was able to do was it enabled this opportunity for people on in the community to actually have a say in what happens within the police and so i think that that's something that's one way in which we're thinking about how do how are we leveraging these moments that are really really challenging in our country right now and using the tool of political leadership because i mean all that we need to do is to elect these 30,000 young women that have run, that have been through yeah. ignite's training these 35,000 to 
train them to like just to luck them and then like we would all be okay but we still have a lot of work to do because of the country that we're in and the way that the, the systems that are up in place but i think that there is a lot of engagement i'm really excited about 2024 i'm probably mm. like one of few but you know the and i get really excited about election cycles and also understand that the long run is very deep and so ignite yes didn't start planning for 2024 yesterday. We've been planning for 2024 since 2020. Um, yes. And so there have been lots of very intricate <laughs> and deliberate steps that we have been taking to prepare ourselves internally so that we can be ready for um, this generation as they get ready for 24. So as we as we wrap things up, Sarah, if someone's listening, I'm sure people listening are inspired by this conversation. You're you're a part of it. And if they are themselves a young a girl or young woman, or they are the parent of same or friends of someone who they think might be interested in Ignite, how do they find out if it's possible in their area if you're if you're there? And if you're not, are there ways the South Dakota example, is there a way to to start something in their own in their own backyard? Yeah, everybody is welcome. So they just have to go to the website, www.ignitenational.org. You can find us on all of the social media channels. And there, you know, you just have to ask and we will help bring you <laughs> what you need to get you um, on your journey and your path to political leadership. Terrific. And again, you've brought a sense of hope and optimism to a part of our society that dearly needs it. We, we just, we just, we have a, we have a, mindset these days is quite defeatist when it comes to politics and government and talking to someone like you and I can only imagine the, the women you're training it's very inspiring and I really thank you for doing this work thank you Bill thank you so much for having me it was a great pleasure take care the enthusiasm and optimism that Sarah Guillermo brings to her work is infectious and it's also inspiring to hear how far Ignite has come, from Sarah's plotting and planning in the founder's basement, to today being active in over 30 states and having a workforce that is 40% alumni of the program. Ignite is making a real positive difference, and it'll be fun to watch them continue to grow into the future. We can all sit around and complain about our politics and government, or we can be like Sarah and the young women of Ignite and get out to vote, run, or campaign. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky conversation with Ignite CEO, Sarah Guillermo. Before you go, if you have a minute to leave us a rating or review, we'd really appreciate it. And while you're at it, subscribing to this podcast will help you make sure you don't miss any future episodes, as would subscribing to the Optimism Institute on social media. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke, and I thank you for listening. Listening.